Hello, everyone, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Better the Pond podcast, where we talk to amazing people doing incredible things that lead the charge of generosity. My name is Warren Berry, and I'm your host and the founder of Instinctive Solutions, where we believe that everyone is an odd duck, but that's what makes them awesome. Today, our guest is Amy Bruski. How do you define success? That was the pivotal question that changed Amy's life. Born, born in Argentina, then living in Brazil, and now in Arizona, Amy always felt like the odd duck for the woman who wanted to lead and have a professional career. Now the president of Colby Corp, an author, speaker, and trainer, Amy's discovered that doing things her way and having the freedom to be herself became her definition of success. Amy is passionate about helping people, especially the youth, discover their innate instinctive talents, which creates the ripples to better the pond. Let me introduce to you, Amy Bruski. So Amy Bruski, I wanna thank you ever so much for taking the time out of your life to be a guest on my Better the Pond podcast. Thank you so much, Warren. I'm excited to be here and have a great conversation today. Yeah, so we've known each other for what, 10, 12, 13 years, I guess, and, and oh, sure. uh, through Colby. And so um, before I jump right into this, I actually want to get sort of a, you know, well, you'll see actually on the screen where, so we know that you are a 3583. Mm -hmm. so, so to the listeners out there who don't know what Colby is, um, I would just give me a little quick little synopsis so you can kind of, so people can understand why these numbers are on the screen. Sure. Okay. Well, let me just start with our mission because that's where it all starts. You know, we have a mission to change people's lives by helping them understand their own instinctive strengths and the people around them, and then put that into play in whatever way matters to them most. So it is about discovering what is unique about you and how you take action. So it's not personality. It's not your intelligence or what you're capable of doing. It is that we all have an instinctive or innate way of taking action when we get things done and solve problems. And so what that means is if people could just tap into that, it would make a massive difference in their levels of stress, in how much they get done and finding joy in work and relationships and being able to put your purpose kind of into work in a way that, that makes sense to you. So for me, there are just four different ways that we look at this. Um, is how do you handle information and data? And for me, I'm much more of a simplifier kind of a person. Um, there's other people, like I work hand in hand with my stepbrother, we run Colby Corp together, and he is about details and data and strategy. And so we make a great team because we're different in that way. Uh, but I am naturally gonna bottom line things. And that's, that's a gift. And for years, I tried to change that about myself. We can talk <laughs> about that. Uh, there's also how you handle structure. So are you someone that very, very naturally designs and organizes in a traditional way? You know, so forcing closure on things, doing things in a systematic way. Or are you someone who's more adaptable? So when the plan isn't working, you're going to shift gears and you're going to go in a different direction very naturally. Um, and so I'm kind of in the middle of the road there. It's like I'm going to adapt to structure that's there if I can versus create it. Um, and I'm going to adapt when I need to. And then there's how do you handle change? Like, what do you do with innovation change? Are you someone that drives that? and actually drives things to be done differently and experiments a lot? Or are you someone that is a fabulous stabilizing force where you are going to make sure that things don't get too risky? Um, and I'm, you and I are a lot alike in that. I will <laughs> drive, I absolutely will drive change and experiment and try things out and innovate um, as are a lot of entrepreneurs fall into that category. Mm -hmm. And then lastly is how do you handle space intangibles? So what do you do with the three-dimensional world? Are you someone that builds a model in order to solve a problem and you're, you're someone that's very concrete in your ideas? Or are you someone that's more abstract? You don't have to see it to believe it. Um, and I know about me is I'm much more in that abstract end, whereas my husband is completely the opposite and he's brilliant at what is true today and, and truly in building three-dimensionally and using tools and, and those kinds of things. So that's it in a nutshell. And so, and to, to the listeners out there, this is the conative 
aspect of the mind, C-O-N-A-T-I-V-E. And where most people actually, and it's even put into spell check, it'll come out as cognitive. And yeah. so we want to make sure that people understand that this is the conative aspect of the mind and it's your instinctive drive of getting things done. So, and with your 3583, three, that is what makes you awesome, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Everyone's and everyone's combination of talents are great. Yeah. And by the way, the cognitive part of the mind, Aristotle and Plato wrote about this. This is not something Colby Corp has created. There are these three parts of the mind, what you can do or your cognitive. Uh, there's the affect, which is your personality, your desires, what you want to do. And then this third part is the cognitive, which is how you will get it done. So it's been long established that these three dimensions of the mind exist. It's just we are the ones that are measuring that and giving that information to people. But I think, too, that was a sort of a piece that was almost kind of forgotten about for a while because there was so much lean, or at least from my perspective, there was so much lean on your intelligence and there was so much lean on your personality. But this piece was kind of sitting in the background. It was, of course, it was always there, but it was never really talked about. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I have to say, I mean, when, when I talk about my story and my experience in my life and how I got where I am now, my life was all about school and knowledge and the cognitive and those kinds of things growing up. So I'm so grateful that I've discovered this other dimension. And you just gave me the perfect segue right Great. there. So, right. so Amy, what I want to know is what took you from being a gosling mm -hmm. to leaving the nest uh -huh. to the person that you are today? So I want you to take me back um, I, I want to know your backstory. What's made you, you, I, and I, I think this is gonna be such a fascinating story. What made you awesome? So take me okay. back and bring me up to today. So what a lot of people don't know about me, even that work with me is I was born in South America. So my father was an executive for Citicorp bank in the sixties. And he was moved to South America to open up all the banks down there. It was an interesting time to be there. Uh, but I was born in Argentina. And then we moved around a little bit in Argentina and then I moved to Brazil. And so I went to American schools, but in the American schools down there, um, you spoke the language. So I spoke Spanish and English both uh, from birth really. And that was what's expected at school. And then I ended up speaking Portuguese when I was in Brazil. And then I moved back to the States when I was eight. Or I shouldn't say moved back. We really moved for the first time to the States when I was eight years old. And how was that shift? I mean, number one, well, first of all, first question is, do you still speak Spanish? Um, I do. My Spanish is very, is very weak. It's interesting. The difference between my brother and me is he came over, he was two years older than I was, and he kept his Spanish going. For me, it's interesting you ask, how was the shift? I went to grade school and I got teased endlessly because I had never lived in the States. I had weird clothes. I, you know, I was just, I was different. I had not been there. I didn't know the TV shows people were into. And I had such bullies in my school that would drag me into the bathroom and say, speak Spanish and try and force me to speak Spanish. So I came home one day and I told my parents, I am never speaking Spanish again. And so there started kind of several years where I wouldn't speak it. So I can understand it most fluently. I can speak it if I go somewhere where they speak Spanish long enough. Um, so my husband used to be a professional baseball player and he would play in the winners in winter ball. So I went to uh, Venezuela for a month and I started dreaming in Spanish within a week of being there. So it's in there. It's yeah. locked away still. So I can get by with it, but it's just, it's very rusty. Portuguese, not at all. Because there was only two years of my life where I was speaking Portuguese. Uh -huh. And my parents said I started all of, we started confusing all three languages together when they added the third one in. So that <laughs> I, I do not. I am just in the midst, I'm a week, I mean, week six or week seven of learning Spanish. It was, it's, it's, it's on my bucket list and I'm finally, right, making the choice. I'm not, so so I'm, uh, I'm actually working with a guy down in, um, uh, in the Dominican Republic. So I am learning Spanish. So if I get yeah. stuck, can I, can I come to you? Yeah, sure. You can try, but it sounds like you've got an expert. Yeah, that's wonderful. Good for you. How fun. That's a great bucket list, really. I mean, anytime we can continue to speak more languages and learn languages, it's fabulous. Yeah, it's super fun. So it's, it's challenging. I mean, I wish I would have done a lot of years sooner, but, uh, mm -hmm. but it's a challenge all the same. I'm, up, I'm always up for a new challenge. Yeah, well, and that's why as children, we learn languages so easily and we wait till we're adults. It's hard. So it is great when my 
my older brother that I mentioned earlier is married to a Peruvian woman and they made sure one of them spoke English in the house and one of them spoke Spanish in the house and their my niece is completely bilingual. So, really? That yeah. that that's cool. So you yeah. so you were so you were in Venezuela, then to Brazil and then to the US. So that is actually what brought you into Phoenix? Yeah. So we moved to Arizona when I was when I was eight, as I had mentioned, and then I lived here for quite a while. I mean, I stayed here until I went to college and then um, I was one of the only people I knew that left the state for school. So I went to California, um, went to L.A. and went to school there and I didn't come back for 15 years. So there started my travel. Travel has been a part of my life. I decided when I graduated college, um, I started working for Jenny Craig Weight Loss Centers, which was really interesting when it was booming like crazy. And I told myself for five years, I'm gonna say yes to anything that they offer me. And so I moved five times in five years, lived all around the country. At the same time, my husband, for a while, that was my boyfriend, then fiance, then husband was playing minor league baseball. So he was moving all around the country. So we lived a very nomadic life for 15 years and then came back to Arizona. So I'm back here now. <laughs> so how yeah. was that? I mean, that, isn't that an interesting concept? I'm going to say yes to everything that comes my way. Yeah, it, it was a weird thing. I just said, no matter what they offer me, no matter how scary it is, I'm just going to say yes to it. And what a great time in your life to do that, right? It's just, I knew eventually I would come back to Arizona, but I felt like I had to do that. And, you know, I didn't want to be some of the places I ended up, but it was amazing. I'm glad I did it. And then I traveled for my job. I actually worked in the franchise department and I was opening up new markets. So I was in Alabama and Oklahoma and then, you know, wherever I, wherever they were opening, I was in Canada. I went and opened the centers in Toronto. Um, nice. So I just traveled 75% of the time for my wow. job for a long time. So we, and were you married at that time or, or was, were you, we had a fiance at that time? Where were you at in your relationship? Yeah, for part of the time, um, we were dating and then engaged. And then when we got married, um, I kept traveling for part of that time. But it wasn't until we were going to have children that I said, okay, this is not going to work. I, I really, you know, we need to be in one place. And so I took kind of a, a, a tra I kind of transitioned out of my job and came back to Arizona and started working part time for Colby. So that's how, that's how I got here because I could do it in the off season. Um, but you know, you only have one shot to play baseball. You can't go ham hey, and take a break. So my wife can work. So that kind of, uh, drove but, that that, but that must've been really fascinating. You're on the road 75% of your time. So you're all over the, you're all over the U S yeah. and into Canada. And then he was playing ball. So he, of course he's traveling all over the place. So how yeah. did you, how did you manage to keep that all together to <laughs> get to the point? Love, love is a very powerful thing. Apparently. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, I got to be a really good travel agent. It's funny because my company would, would book the travel and I'd say, if I can save money, can I add a stop or do a whatever? And back then I could just look it up and say, okay, I have two weeks in this city. I'm going to do a stop over wherever he would be and then come back. And I would just add stops. And back then, if you like would travel that way, you could actually save some money or it wouldn't be more expensive. So I would find ways to see him. <laughs> yeah, it was it was nuts. It was nuts. I don't recommend it to anyone, but uh, it was fun. You know, I learned a lot, and it was great. Um, and so, the, so the whole you did the whole Jenny Craig. So, what made you shift from Jenny Craig then coming into Colby? Mostly um, because I was I knew that we were going to move back to Arizona. <clears throat> there was not a market here for me. I really needed to work at a corporate office if I wanted to stay there. Um, so I did move back here and I was looking for something to do part-time in the off season. So in the off season, my husband would take time off. He became Mr. Mom and I would go to work full time for those, for those months when we could do it once we finally had kids. Uh, but you know, how I got to Colby is a totally different thing because that was just a life-changing event for me as far as discovering who I was and my instinctive strengths. And that, that really drove me to making completely different decisions in my career. Well, I want to hear all about that. Take me in. Let's 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 get into the details. Okay. I know we're, we're, we're either one of us are really detaily people, but yeah. let's get into the details. Of this I want to hear this. Well, so uh, you know, if I had to really go a little bit even farther back, I was always so different than the rest of my family. I mean, I will just tell you that growing up in my house, first of all, my parents were brilliant. You know, dad went to 
Um, he got his MBA at Berkeley. My mother had gone to Stanford. They were very intellectual. Um, and growing up in my house was sitting at the dinner table and debating whatever it was. And you had to have justifications. And if you were going to talk about politics, you had to have all of your you know, data and information. And I truly thought that I was never very smart. I, I got straight A's, like all through high school. I never even got a B. But two things happened. One, I knew I was really different from my family. And two was I would do something like take a test. Like I would take a history test. I would get a great grade. And then it would just shh, like gone. You know, a couple of weeks later, it just either had no meaning to me or I couldn't maintain the facts. I just, they, they didn't stick with me. So if you want to have a, you know, a debate with me over the dinner table, I'm going to say, why do you well, justify your point? Or why do you feel that way? It's like, because I do, <laughs> you know, I mean, this is just, that's what came naturally to me. And so early in my career, when I was working for Jenny Craig, I had, I was making more money by far than anyone I knew my age. I had taken every promotion. I was the youngest person running an entire division um, for sales training. I had Toronto down to Florida. And then I met Kathy Colby because she was dating my father. So my mother had passed away. Kathy was dating my dad. And she asked me a question that completely changed my life. She said, um, gosh, you have a lot going on. This is great. This is some wild success. And she said, so how do you define success? No one had ever asked me that question before. I said, well, I, I'm doing it, right? Because in my family, it was about getting more degrees and more of what you could put in and you know, accomplishing things in that way, in a very traditional way. And she said, well, I define success as the freedom to be myself. And that had never occurred to me because although I had been really successful at Jenny Craig, I was miserable. I was not happy. I was learning. And so I, and I do love to learn. I love to have new experiences and, and the cognitive things, but my job itself, my role itself was not well-suited for me. It was dragging me down. I was exhausted. So I was working against my strengths. I didn't know that at the time, but when she defined that to me, I said, okay, what does that mean? What's the freedom to be yourself? <laughs> and uh, I ended up taking the Colby Index and you know, it's a short assessment, it's 36 questions. But when I got my result, it was the biggest light bulb. It was the biggest aha about why I was so different than the people in my family. And it wasn't about me not being smart. It was just, I didn't naturally do things that way. Mm -hmm. And so um, that kind of brought me then to Colby part-time. And I have always been really passionate about psychology. Like what I'm most fascinated by, if someone asks you what fascinates you, it's human behavior. But in college, I decided, well, I'm not going to become a psychology major. That's not very practical. I don't want to be a therapist. What am I going to do with that? And so when I met Kathy, I realized I have a business degree and marrying a business degree with my love for human behavior was just like a no brainer. It was such a natural fit. So I just fell in love. Um, so that's what really got me back here and, and changed my life. All my decisions became different. Like I just started making different decisions about my career. I left the, I left my other position. Um, I started working at Colby part-time and I've just loved it. So I have two so, questions for you. Um, do you have any brothers or sisters? That's I don't know. I don't know your, your, your family history. And I, I, I yeah. know, I know, I know the big picture. I don't know any of the details. So how many are yeah. in your family? Okay, so I grew up with an older brother and a younger brother. So there were three of us. And, um, and they've lived in other parts of the world and other parts of the country. So we're all spread out. One's in New York right now, one's in DC. And then I have a stepbrother and a stepsister um, from Kathy's marriage to my father. So David Colby and I, my stepbrother, we run the business together. And that's been a great partnership. And then my sister is a therapist here. So we've got okay. that going on here. <laughs> so, so she went down that road. Uh -huh. So, but now when you look back, you're talking about how you were different from your family. Were you different from your siblings as well as your parents? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It was all five of us at the dinner table. And I just, not only did I have different interests, I just think personality wise, I was also different, mm -hmm. but the way they went about solving problems was about structure they would tell me, why are you waiting till the last minute to study? <laughs> and, it's like, and I had so much guilt about that. And they're like, if you would have just started sooner, this would be less stressful for you. And here I am at 10 o'clock at night, right? Cramming for my test and thinking, yeah, why didn't I start sooner? 
So my siblings were certainly more like that and my parents were more like that. And I just was, as you say, an odd duck, right? Yeah. yeah. Was, yeah. And we're, and we're going to get to that. We're actually going to talk about you being the odd duck because um, I think it's fascinating. Um, and one thing I'll, I'll bring up, and, and of course, you know this, but I'm just really giving this for the listeners, too, is that when we look at the, you know, the, the conative aspect of the mind or the, the instinctual aspect, that it has nothing to do with genetics. So there you are in a family, right, who is you know, you're all together, you have the same values, you're at the dinner table, everything is the same, except yet you feel like the odd duck in your own family, right? Absolutely. And you're, and you're yep. approaching the, the same problem in a completely different way. But yet, right. but yet the values and everything else around the, around the dinner table are all the same. Absolutely. Yeah, you can, and you can have that. So in one family, you can have people that are so different in the way they execute or in this cognitive part of the mind. And if we could just get to the point of pinpointing that and valuing that, it would change everything. I just would have had a completely different feeling about my own strengths and I would have stopped trying to change myself sooner. So I was trying to always emulate my parents and do things the way they did it. And my older brother was incredibly structured and organized. So I'm like, why can't I be more like that? And it just, I couldn't maintain it in the same way. Yeah, I agree. And you know, when I, I remember back when I did my Colby um, many, many years ago, I was actually in transition the first time I did mine. Um, mm -hmm. And when I got my result, I was all upset because what's this transition thing? And, um, and so finally, and when looking back, um, I was in transition, I was completely in transition. Um, so when I did it again, it was um, really one of the most liberating days that I've had in my life. It was so yeah. memorable to realize that, and, and I, I share your sentiment. I mean, I, th I thought I was stupid. Um, I thought, I mean, I, I kind of realized why I'm a squirrel and you know, I, I run around last minute and I'm all over the map, right? But it is how I get things done. And it really, for myself, it flipped everything upside yeah. down to realize that this is actually what makes me who I am. And, and I was trying so hard to, to work harder and harder and harder so that, you know, that I was trying to almost trying to override it. Yes. And, it, and, it, and it wasn't working. It's and exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting. And, yeah. you know, and one of the things that was really fascinating is when I got my result, it was like, wow, like, have these people been following me around? Like, this is almost creepy. You know? <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. But it was, it was, it was, it was so liberating. You just like, it's like, wow, they're, you know, and, and I agree. And I've said it a thousand times, you know, it is the, the definition of success is the freedom to be yourself and right. to be able to do it your way and, and not, you know, not work against your grain because yeah. yeah as you said, it's just completely um, exhausting. Yeah. And you are capable of doing it. I, I proved that you did that. I was in a role. Unfortunately, what happened to me is I got in a role where I kept being validated and valued for working against my brain. So I was having more promotions, more money given to me to actually do the opposite of what I really should have been doing. And this is what happens. I mean, I have to tell you that my goal is to never hear one more 50, 60 year old, whatever it is, come to me and say, I hate my job. If I just would have known this earlier, I would have made different decisions. So I'm, I do feel fortunate that I figured that out a lot earlier because mm -hmm. then your, your choices become a lot clearer and easier. Absolutely. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. So when you, going back to this, when you started back at Colby and you, mm -hmm. and you were working part-time, so now, you know, you know, we'll bring you up to present day, but I mean, you're now the president, but when you started, what was your role when you first came into Colby Corp? I first came in as a consultant, actually, because I had been a sales trainer and a manager trainer for the company. So I'd learned a lot of really good sales skills and sales training skills. And so Kathy had said, hey, we need some help with our salespeople. Will you come in and do that? And so I did come in with, in that way. And then I slowly became an account manager. I ended up loving it. Now, Kathy, to her credit, when you run a family business, there's a lot of do's and don'ts. And that's why Kathy and I wrote a book on this because we have lived it. And the first thing is, you know, you don't just bring a child of an owner into a business just because they need a job. So um, I was able to fit a need and it was just a temporary basis. And then we both realized this is a great fit and I stayed on. And then I started doing more like account management and sales and then became a, a leader in the company pretty soon after that. Started managing people within probably a year or two. 
And so looking back when you started and, you know, being into account manager and those pieces, uh, and then looking back at Jenny Craig, um, were you able to, you know, once you started a Colby Corp and started going down that road, did, did you feel a difference in, in how you got to do your work and to more be yourself and, and found some more freedom there? Sure. I mean, part of it was just, I went from a corporation to an entrepreneurial environment. So that alone was amazing because I would say, let's try this. Let's experiment with that. Let's create a new campaign. Hey, how about this product? Maybe we should be um, coming up with new things for our clients. So the environment was different and my role was all of a sudden different where every day could be a new thing because it was really static before. It was a lot of data. I was doing a lot of research. I was running a, a, a division where the people were doing the fun stuff, right? The people out in the field were doing the stuff that, that I really wanted to do. So my job used to be about people and then it just became more about numbers and, and managing things. Once I got to Colby, I got to do hands-on and, and every day was different. Right. Every day we were creating, yeah. So looking back at the Jenny Craig bit, right? As your, as your role sort of changed and morphed and you got more into the sort of upper management, we'll call it. Um, was there a piece of you that knew that something wasn't right? Did you, did you know at that time that this just wasn't a fit? Was, did you have something nagging in the back of your mind? Yeah, I definitely knew that it was taking more effort than when I was doing training. So I used to do stand-up classes and I was doing training. And then when I started moving up, um, meetings were difficult, having to report on things, long, long reports and things were difficult. But there was something that was, um, I started to kind of go down the hole where maybe I'm not competent, maybe I'm not capable of doing this that I had been in when I was in school. Um, so I had really early success, which is why I had all these promotions. And all of a sudden I started feeling this, this isn't working. What is wrong with me? This is not difficult, you know, um, because I knew I was capable of doing it, but I really started hating it. I remember having to go to the office every day when I wasn't on the road visiting my markets and just being tortured. And, Isn't that and, interesting? And yet yeah. you were, but you were so successful. Yeah. And people are capable of being successful. And that's why when people hear about their strengths for the first time, um, or they have a job they want and you coach them and kind of say, okay, let's talk about what that would look like for you, because mm -hmm. you know that it's probably not a great fit. They'll say, but I can do it. And it's like, of course you can, you're fully capable of it, but let's think about what that looks like long-term. So I think everyone should take a job where they work against their brain, by the way. I, this mm -hmm. is what I wish for my own kids, believe it or not, is that in order to develop coping skills, in order to have a little bit of empathy for people who are working really hard in ways that don't work for them, um, I think that everyone should be in that position at some point. And you do develop some resilience and some um, skills for working against your grain. And by the way, we all have to do that. I mean, my job is not 100% of the time I get to do everything I want to do. Um, but for extended periods of time, we know people completely burn out and they lose confidence and it, it's just terrible. Mm -hmm. that there are so many people in the workforce right now. And it's, by the way, it's, it's such a big solution to our engagement problem. We know some of the reasons that people aren't engaged in the workforce, but this is one thing that, that a lot of people aren't looking at. There's this other piece too, that no amount of cult working on your culture and your values and the fun that you have and including everybody, no amount of doing those things is going to fix for an individual who's not getting to use their strengths. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, and as you know, I'm doing research and I, I, call, I call it case studies because re the word research makes my, my two and fact finders skin crawl. But, yeah. um, but, you know, but on the, on the uh, aspect of cognitive stress and chronic pain, and I think that's part of, you know, the, when the disengagement goes even further past um, just checking out where I believe that people will get sick. I believe that their body will naturally take them out just to try to protect them. Yes. Uh, so it's a much and people tell you that. They will say, I was sick, or I would, you know, people would say, I would be nauseous going to work, or I was so stressed out that I was completely sick. And all of a sudden they get out of this environment or make a change and things change. Yeah. So, yeah. Isn't, isn't that incredible? The, the connection to, to your health and, and your stress, your how it affects your mental health, and then ultimately your physical health is fascinating to me too. So I'm, you know, I'm so glad that 
that is something you're passionate about. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is just, it, uh, I, I can't let it go. It's just, it, it just encompasses my, my mind on a, on a daily basis. So but this, isn't, this isn't about me, this is about you. So presently, you are the president of Colby Corp. And obviously you're, you're doing training and whatnot for bringing you know, new consultants on. And, um, and are, you, are you doing also um, some consulting for other you know, organizations and, and whatnot as well? Yeah, I do get brought in for consulting gigs and sometimes people want me to just be kind of their consultant on call. I'm not doing as much of that uh, anymore. My real passion is in training people now to be consultants. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to empower people to add this to their coaching practice or their consulting practice or whatever it might be. And um, if I had more time, what my future really is um, working more with kids and youth and those kinds of things. But as far as the workplace right now, I'm either helping design programs, uh, doing the training myself, and then of course running our own staff and operations and you know at a higher level here in Colby. So we're this little microcosm. Uh, I, I am glad that I'm still doing hands-on leadership kinds of things because you get to experience the challenges that your clients are, are experiencing every day. So mm -hmm. I am an entrepreneur. I am an owner. I'm also a team leader. I'm also a team member. I get to live all of that. And that's where all my ideas come from about what solutions do we need that don't exist right now. And you have no shortage of ideas. No, <laughs> no, that's a, that's my challenge. Actually, <laughs> Why am I going to just have people that I'm going to go, here's another idea. Go, go do something with it. Yeah, that's my dream. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So, you know, I believe, Amy, that we're all odd ducks. I believe that we're all misfits. Um, can you tell me about a time, and we led into this earlier, but tell me about a time where, you know, where you didn't fit in, um, where you were different. And that can be positive or negative, right? Yeah. And, and I want to dig into this a little bit because just what what makes you you? What makes you awesome? And, and, and that's the thing. I believe that it's, it's our odd duckness, right? It's what mm -hmm. makes it awesome and makes us unique. So what's that for you? Yeah. So gosh, I mean, definitely the fact that I already told you about my family. I, I was absolutely an odd duck in my family and the way I got things done. Um, I was also a really odd duck from the time I was a kid that I loved math. I hate art so much. I hated art and I hated PE and anything like that. I was really kind of a math kid. And so I started negotiating at a really young age. Like when I was in fifth grade, I negotiated to get out of art class that I would tutor second graders in math if I could skip art class. So I know my brain just doesn't work that way. And I ended up having a daughter who loves crafting and is hands on. And to walk into a Michael's store, do you guys have Michael's in yep. Canada? Do yep. like an arts and craft? That like gives me hot. Like, like literally to have to walk in and do something like that. So I always knew that um, I had more of a talent for math and I always uh, was probably kind of bossy. It's kind of funny how we talk about girl being called bossy is a bad thing. But when people would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would say the president all the time when I was a little kid. And you know what they told me in the 60s and 70s when I would say that to adults, they'd say, oh, honey, you're a girl. You can't be the president of the United States. So unfortunately, we still don't, haven't had a woman president, right? But that was just kind of my, my mindset was very different. And um, my friend, even my friends in high school, I talked about a career from a very young age. I don't know why. I just was always very career driven. And um, my friends thought that was weird. And it was somehow a put down to their moms who were stay at home moms that, mm. you know, I didn't want to. I wanted to buy my husband a birthday present someday with money that I had made. Like I made that comment once and I got absolutely told that I'm crazy and what's wrong with being a stay-at-home mom. So kind of from a very young age, being a career-minded person was huge to me. And um, being a woman in the workplace was big. Um, solving problems was big. And I was made to feel like that was something very strange for someone. You know, I'm 53 years old now. So, you know, back when I was growing up, that was uh not okay hmm. not okay at all and not validated so do you think that going back to your parents being professionals and being mm -hmm. you know very educated and and i'm sure they probably had a lot of sort of prestige when down in south america and then being in the banking and whatnot sure. i do think that that was a bit of a driver for you growing up in that environment as well 
Yeah, I think so. I absolutely think so. Because even my mother being in South America, women back there, like my husband was, th- or my husband, my father was thinking he could get my mother a job at the bank. Well, back then women had to be in the back room counting money. Right. You couldn't see a woman in, in the bank, right? Yeah. And so what she did instead was um, she started a bunch of these groups that's now very famous called La Leche League, which is a breastfeeding group to teach back then formula was a big deal and there's impoverished areas where people are buying formula and she was trying to you know get people in South America to understand that breastfeeding was better for the baby and it's free and all that so she started a whole chapter down there and so she was always dabbling in something she could do and so that was a role model for me to see how that could be done yeah to see how a woman would be basically leading the way yeah, you right. couldn't work and get a normal job in some cases, but at least she was she was doing something. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's a bit of for me, even listen, when my husband was playing baseball, talk about an odd duck. I was the only baseball wife I knew on some of the teams we were on that worked. I mean, I kept working during baseball and they thought that was the weirdest thing ever. So when he got um, it's so funny, I'm glad you're reminding me that you're bringing up this memory I'd forgotten about. Um two things that I remember. One is the day he got called up to the major leagues, he was playing for the Los Angeles Dodgers. And I had never been to the big leagues. I don't know what I'm doing. You sit in this big long line of all these baseball wives that I'm meeting for the first time. And I'll never forget like eight people down, kind of the head wife, right? One of the most seasoned wives bends down, looks at me and says, you work. And I said, yeah. And her follow-up question was, why that's all she could say and I don't even know how to answer that right it's like I boy if that's if you really don't know why I don't you know I wasn't going to start this conversation with eight people that I had never met and then one time I was actually on a plane with the team because every once in a while you could travel with the team and I was reading a business week and the pitching coach stopped me and he said wait a second he said, in all my years as a player and all my years as a coach, I've never seen a wife reading a business week ever. You know, so I was definitely very much an odd duck when but I was a baseball player. Isn't that interesting, though? You said you, you said something very important there. You said, uh, he said, I've never seen a wife read a business uh-huh. book. So yeah. you were actually, he was labeling you as a wife of a baseball player and not as a woman of yourself. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. That was an interesting place to be back then. Yeah, it was just, and you know, that's much more current day. I mean, it was still yeah. years ago, but that's not back in the 60s and the 70s. You know, this was in the 90s. Yeah, like that's not that far back. It, you know, yeah. and it's, isn't that amazing that, 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 that um, just that thought process, right? Yeah. Of just, that's just the way that it was. And, and, and people seem to accept it. So by you trying to um, be your own person, and and be want to want to drive forward and, and go into business was you being an odd duck. Yes. Yeah. That, and wanting to have a career. That, and by the way, and as they say, have it all, because my greatest joy in my whole life is being a mother. I always wanted to be a parent. I mean, that's always been in, in my realm too. And that's more important than anything. But I wanted to do both. And yeah. that was somehow not okay. <laughs> yes, that's a, yeah, it's not okay to do both. You have to have one or the other, right? Right. Yeah, isn't right. that fascinating? So that that's a great story. I love that story. So so we're going to shift gears here a little bit, Amy. And can you tell me about a time when someone did something for you that left an impact on your life? Mm-hmm. I mean, honestly, I tell the story all the time about Kathy asking me that question. I, I, on, I truly think that when she shifted my viewpoint on what does success look like, that was one of the biggest changes for me ever. Um, I have also had someone, my first boss ever was a mentor for me and she didn't even know she was one. I was just working in college and she was a uh, entrepreneur in her thirties running one of the most successful market research companies in Los Angeles with all the major ad agencies um, working for her. And uh, she gave me an opportunity to work part-time at night running these focus groups and things. And I got to watch someone who was 30 years old with little kids running this business and being herself and being it successfully. And and she absolutely taught, would pull me aside and teach me some lessons. And I'm still, um, I'm still connected to her. 
We actually, all of us that used to work for her, and she's 76 years old, 76, I think now, has invited us on trips. Those of us young women that worked for her and stuff, so I'm still connected to her. So truly, she gave me a vision of what success could look like um, that I needed. So she gave you that vision of what success could look like. Kathy gave you the the different change your perception of what what actually success really did look like right um so you put the combination of the two together and that's 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 pretty impactful on yeah on. yes i was really lucky to have those role models and so i hope to do that for other people you know my goal is to be able to do the same for anyone else that would need it and not that they would have to be like me or have a life like mine, but that um, everyone deserves possibilities. Everyone deserves to see things in a different way and see what the possibilities are, not just what your parents told you you should be or, you know, emulating someone that maybe doesn't work for you. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing right now presently to better the pond? And also, I'm going to add another question to that. So what are you doing presently to better the pond? And, and more importantly to me is why are you doing it? Mm-hmm. So my, my biggest passion right now is making sure that we reach as many people as possible. Like our reach is just nowhere near great enough to give people the gift of understanding their own instinctive strengths. Because what I get to hear every day is someone telling me this saved my marriage. I wish, you know, or thank you so much. Now I understand why this career isn't working for me or whatever it is. And so we want to start that at a much younger age. So one of the things, I'm actually chairman of our nonprofit. So we have a nonprofit called the Center for Cognitive Abilities. And our goal is to reach more people and donate indexes as possible. Kathy Colby is running a sister company called Dynamind Inc. that's actually focused on creating programs for youth. And I do work with Dynamind as much as I have time to because that is where my real passion is, is getting to more kids. And so one of the things we've done at Colby that started last year for the very first time is we started something called Strengths Week. And it was just a way to kind of make a revolution where uh, we would all donate our time and donate indexes to just reach more people that wouldn't have the ability to do it or couldn't afford a, a Colby A index or whatever it might be. And so um, as our first initiative, we only reached you know a little over a thousand indexes, and this year we are going to do so much better. So we had about thirty something consultants involved in over five countries. It was just to dabble and say <laughs> how is this going to work, and now the first week in March we're going to do it again. So my goal to better the pond that I can really control and that I have the talent to do is reach even more people. Uh, and certainly reach more relationships and parents and kids, because I do think that there is something to be said for, as parents, it is human nature that we are going to raise our kids to do things the way we would have done them, because that's just the deal. It's like, hey, this worked for me. This was success for me. Let me help you. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we are not always the best to be role modeling how to execute, how to get things done for our kids. So the more that we can get this information in the hands of kids so that they can advocate for themselves and parents so that they can be better parents and stop focusing so much on the process that your children are using and instead focus on defining what success looks like as an end result mm -hmm. and helping them find the freedom to get there in a way that works for them best. So do you think this goes back to, you know, when you were a kid um, and being that odd duck and then, you know, really understand after the fact sort of understanding why it was, um, are you looking back and sort of trying to leverage that and now and seeing the impact that you can have because of your own personal experience? Yeah, sure. I mean, who, who better to do it? I've kind of lived it and I, and I think I have some sense of what kind of pain that can cause. Mm -hmm. um, but we have the opportunity now, the more that we can grow the business and we can be a profitable business, then we can give back. So uh, it's, yeah, absolutely. Based on my experience, I don't want anyone to have to go through some of that. I mean, feeling like you're not smart mm -hmm. uh, at any age, no matter what your grades. I mean, in my case, I happen to have gotten great grades. So it would have said otherwise. There are brilliant children. Every child is equally capable and equally gifted who absolutely have no self-esteem and think they're not smart just because school doesn't work for them. Mm -hmm. Just because the educational institution doesn't work for them. 
I agree. And you know, it's funny that you say that because in my own personal experience, I, in, in college, I graduated top of my class mm -hmm. and yet I thought I wasn't smart. Yes. I just, you know, I'd read something and it would just disappear and I'd read something it would disappear. And I'm like, yes. but, but I'm getting great grades, but I, but I just, I, I thought I wasn't smart. Right. You know, Absolutely. So I, I experienced the exact same thing that you experienced as well. And, and again, um, seeing that and knowing why was, yeah, and again, that was such a game changer for me to realize that it, again, it had nothing to do with my intelligence. So, uh, and, and I'm with you there too, of, if, getting you know kids at a younger age to understand this and and i look at this even on the education side of it if teachers could understand how that child problem solves and let them do it their way i mean it would just be it would be just so much better like it would just it would it would be such a game changer right so it, it really it. is the first opportunity to share with someone that these are actual strengths this mm -hmm. thing that you feel is maybe not a strength like this this is something you need to, and it's a strength. When I heard that, I was blown away. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, this is something I need to do better. No, yeah. I need to do better with the with the details and, and remembering things and justifying my points. And, and I was told, no, let go of all that. That's not your thing. You know, yeah. your thing is coming up with new ideas. And so to tell a child these are your strengths and, and help them figure out how to play the game, right? Mm -hmm. We don't get to just, a kid doesn't get to just push back from the teacher and go, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it your way. I mean, you have to learn to play the game as you do in your job sometimes, right? Sure. When you're working for someone else, but it, you're coming at it in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. and it's, and it's possible. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so glad that it did that for you too, Warren, because um, I, I can relate to that level of, of pain and just feeling like, well, I guess I'm just not that capable in these things. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I remember my confidence taking a really big hit because of it. I, you know, it's, it's, it's still very vivid in my memory. Yeah. So you're saying that, um, you know, look, if you look at, but where are you, so where are you at? And, and, you know, look at strengths week and where you want to go and better the pond, where are you at and where do you want to be? Um, well, we're just kicking off our initiative actually this week. So yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, our goal is to, you know, have five times as many indexes given out this year. I mean, we gave over a little over a thousand, but we want as many consultants as possible to participate this year. And we want to help them with that. So if they have a big initiative with an organization or something, then they can apply to get indexes from us. But our goal is that every person would just sit down even with just one person, just one-on-one -on -one even, and just donate your time and give an interpretation to one person um, because to help make a difference in that person's life. So whether it's your neighbor or your friend or a sibling. Um, so it's more about participation and starting a movement. And so we, we had 100% participation with our own staff last year. So my goal is absolutely 100% of everyone that works at Colby Corp will have their own project or participate somehow in a bigger project. And that week we you know, pay them to have the time to go make a difference in someone's life. Um, and just hope we can, we can start that ripple effect with other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and I hope so too, because I mean, I, you know, I want to be a part of this as well. Cause I think it's a, I think it's, it's a really, it's a really important movement. I mean, it's again, and we talked about this, but it can be life changing. It can be uh, just a, a total, shift of your thinking and um and for somebody to come and say you know thank you ever so much for helping me understand why things are the way they are i mean that that's just, that's a gift in and of itself that's right that's right and you hear that with parents too saying okay yes i knew my kids were really different but this gives me information that i need to help them capitalize on that because it is frustrating when a child is really different than you are mm -hmm. and you're constantly trying to change them too and again all from the bet you're coming at it from the best place it's because you want the best for them but it yeah. ends up leading to something that's even more challenging for them yeah absolutely so now looking back and looking forward so you are the wise sage goose on the pond amy and you have your <laughs> crystal ball so yep. from your biggest lesson learned Mm -hmm. Can you paint me a picture of your golden pond? What does your future look like? And looking back at the biggest lesson learned from that. Yeah. So my, like my golden pond for me personally, or for like the world or the organization or. You pick, you get to okay. choose. What is in your mind? 
Yeah. So, I mean, for me personally, I hope it's to better mentor other people and to really change people's lives, you know, whether it's one life at a time or huge groups of people, um, as long as I can be doing that, I'm going to keep working. Uh, the, and my second passion is family business because what I see happen in family business. So I live in a family business. Kathy Colby is my stepmother. I'm working with David. He and I own Colby Corp together and he's my stepbrother. Um, the pain of a family business not working or a relationship not working where one person has to leave is incredible. So I really do want to help families figure out if it makes sense to work together with other family members, what has to be in place first, how to keep appropriate boundaries, how to make those decisions, because if the business fails or the relationship fails, I mean, you, you can imagine it's, it's so much more painful than any other kind of partnership. Um, as far as the world, though, um, you know, my, my vision is that our, we would have an education system that would allow for independent you know, unique strengths to come out. And yes, I get this as a challenge, but I am seeing these schools, they exist. It is possible to help define, you, you learn cognitive skills and you learn knowledge and you learn ability. When you demonstrate the knowledge that you have, that you are able to do that in a way that's very unique to you. So that we are creating adults that are capable of doing so much more who believe in their talents, believe in their strengths, will put it into play in a way that works for them and for others. And that we then build teams of people that have unique respect for each other. Because these things you know, follow from the school place, we go to the workplace, and then we've got teams of people where everyone has to be exactly the same. This crazy group thing starts happening and we've proven that that is not a successful model. You have to have diversity on a team that is working collaborative collaboratively in order to have great results mm -hmm. so you know the, I, I would love for it to start at a much younger age and i would like it to carry into the workplace so that we realize that um this isn't just pie in the sky and it's great because everyone will feel better and have joy in their job <laughs> there is a because i'm a business person there's yep. a business case for this there sure. is absolutely a business case where your business is going to succeed more you're going to be more profitable teams get things done faster and more successfully and with fewer resources when they have the right people on board. Yeah. And I was going to ask you that. I was going to say like, in the, you know, when we look at the, the, the big pond as a whole, the, you know, what do you think the impact would be if we have, you know, diversified teams, um, we have people working better together, right? Um, and um, and then you know people are are they're they're happier, they're healthier, right? They want to come to work. There's more engagement. You know, when we put all those pieces together, right? Um, it's pretty fascinating to start to think where that can lead. Right. What could happen to the workplace? I mean, we're spending millions of dollars on figuring out engagement issues, and this would help with a lot of that. Uh, and you would have people that are self-directing their careers and we'd have more successful organizations. I mean, all around, it is a missing piece of the puzzle that the teams that we work with will tell us that, oh my gosh, this is a missing piece. As a leader, I had no idea if I had just known this sooner. Now I get why this person does better in this situation versus that. So yeah, the impact would be huge. And, um, and I know it sounds very pie in the sky, but I know <laughs> I've seen what it does for individuals. I've seen what it does for organizations. Um, I've seen how it's completely healed relationships mm -hmm. where people are trying to be something they're not in a marriage or a relationship. And there's a lot of strain mm -hmm. and there are some things that you just can't change about who you are. And so that just the awareness alone makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Just, just that little bit. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, does it sound pie in the sky? Sure. But there's a, but the, the, the interesting thing about there's a truth behind it, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, a, it's a truth. Um, it's not just an, it's not just a concept or an idea. It's a truth. And, right. and you are who you are and you, you know, you take yourself with you wherever you go. So, um, so yeah, and I've, I've seen my own personal experience too, of, you know, speaking across Canada and to the United States, working with teams and you see that develop and you see those changes of how people look at things differently and start to appreciate and respect what other people on the team bring to it. Um, that team dynamic changes just, it's again, yeah. Does it sound pie in the sky? Sure it does. But again, it goes back to that truth. It does make a difference. It does make change. Yeah, you and I have been able to see it. So we're lucky get, to get to do what we are doing right now. Absolutely. I certainly feel blessed and lucky to be able to do it.
Yeah, and, and me as well. Um, I'm very, very fortunate and blessed to do what I love to do. And that's that's all part of it. So so this is where we get to give you a plug, Amy. So we know that uh, yourself and Kathy wrote the book, Business to Business. Um, so where can they, where can people, especially in family business, where can people go to find that book? Sure. Um, yeah, business is business. The best place to go is Amazon or wherever else you would buy books online. Uh, and it's by me, Amy Bruski, and Kathy Colby. And Kathy with a K and Colby with a K, K-O-L-B-E. I know a lot of people don't necessarily spell it that way. Um, yeah, and, and feel free, let me give you a plug. Those of you that need excellent coaching and consulting, especially if you want it eventually in person, right? When we can do that. <laughs> we can do that. Warren is your person. He has been Colby certified for a long time and he has excellent skills and abilities and experience doing that so i will say people can also reach out to you um and they can go to colby.com if you just want more information and you want to those of you i didn't get into research today or anything like that those of you that want to really read the research and how the assessments are created and any other solutions to feel free to go to colby.com k-o-l-b-e.com and so, and if, and if people want to find, well, thank you for the plug, by the way. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and if people, if people want to find you, Amy, where do we find you? So me personally, you can certainly find me on LinkedIn um, under Amy Bruski. Please feel free to connect with me. And I'm on Facebook at Amy K, middle initial, like in Catherine Bruski on Facebook too. Um, yeah, you can find me on those two social platforms. Okay, so the social platforms, we've got businesses, businesses of the book. Uh, and if people want more information on Colby, they can go to Colby.com, as we said, uh, and if they want to have more questions for you, uh, in regards to what we talked about today, they can reach out on LinkedIn and on Facebook. Sure. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, I want to thank you ever so much for your time. I know you've got, you've got a lot going on, of course, with the whole COVID thing happening. It's, our world's been turned upside down. So I, I, from my heart, I truly appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk to me today. And this is Warren Berry. I'm flocking off to take you beyond the pond to better the pond because we're better together. Thank you ever so much, Amy. Thank you so much, Warren. It was really fun. <laughs>